So now that we've talked about kind of the, the older school way of doing information hiding with C, let's show a more modern, and I'm using the word modern here loosely, this is probably um, wise people towards the end of the 1970s would have done what I'm about to show you. And this is what I will call a, a data abstraction implementation using C. And you'll see it's, it's not very abstract, but it does in fact solve a few of the problems with the previous code. And I think it's important for fairness to C and uh, C programming to cover this. This will be the last thing we cover before we start really getting into C++. So um, for those of you going, oh my God, this is boring. Why are we doing all this old school stuff? This is just kind of showing you the evolution of programming. And it also sets the stage for the discussion of data abstraction in C++. And you'll see why when we show how the implementation works here. So this implementation appears here. And it is my C data abstraction project. And you'll see the main thing that we solve with this particular approach is the concept of um, the concept of having multiple stacks. Let me refactor this to rename it because I don't like the use of the word. Okay, so now what we're going to do is we're going to use a little data abstraction, and this will solve some of the problems we talked about. Not all of them, but some of them. And it'll set the stage for what C++ did when it first came out. So you can see now we can have multiple stacks, and I'll show you how we do that. And then we still have to initialize the stacks before we use them. So let's assume for sake of argument that we do that. Otherwise, we're in big trouble. And then we're going to go ahead and we're going to do some operations on the stack. Now, I'll show you what the stack interface looks like first. So here's the stack interface. You can see that we have a type of stack element, which is still type def. And then we're going to define, define stack data structure. And this is, you know, really a data struct, literally, because it's a struct. It's a, it's a C style struct. And you can see we use the type def aliasing keyword to say type def this struct to be called stack. So now we can refer to this as stack. That's what a type def does. It just defines a name for a data structure. So in this case, we now have a struct called stack or type def into stack. And it defines top underscore size underscore and stack underscore. So what had previously been hidden within the static fields or the static global variables in the stack.cpp file with the information hiding version is now exported as a first class citizen in the type system. So now we can use this to make stacks. And the way we make stacks is we use the stack create method, which takes the address of a stack. We can then destroy a stack that we created by using the stack destroy method, which also takes the address of a stack. And then we've got push, uh, stack push, stack top, stack pop, stack empty, and stack full. And all of these methods, of course, they do the same thing that the other versions did, except they're past their own pointer to a stack. And that way we can have multiple instances of the stack and we can disambiguate or deconflict them very cleanly by using the techniques we're going to look at here. Now, one thing, one reason I wanted to show you this is when we start looking at how C++ is implemented, you'll see that under the hood, it works much the same way as this example. It's just that you don't have to explicitly pass the pointer to the stack or the pointer to the object for which a method is being invoked. Instead, that's done implicitly for you by the compiler. And so when we talk about the C++ way of doing things, I'll try to remember to tell you about that. And you'll see it just makes your code more concise and, and a heck of a lot less error prone. So that's the interface. Let's go back and look at how we use it, and then we'll look at the implementation. So the actual logic here is pretty much identical to what we did before, just that we can have multiple stacks. So we can say, while well, stack's not full, we can go ahead and um, push an element into the stack. And you'll notice everywhere that we make a call to a stack underscore push, pop, top, et cetera, function, we pass the address of the stack that we're calling this function on behalf of. So for this example, we're using the address of S1, but it would be easy to make S2, S3, and so on, assuming we remember to initialize them. So this code will do the same basic thing as before, pretty much identical. 
But here's where we get ourselves into trouble. So you can see here that we're trying to use assignment of one stack to another. So we're going to set S2 to the value of S3. Of course, we haven't initialized S3, so that's first uh, an indication of a problem. But let's, let's assume, just for sake of argument, just to make it more clear what the problems are here, let's assume for sake of argument that we actually had gone ahead and initialized S3. We've done something like this. So S3 would be initialized. This would still be a disaster, and that's because all we're doing is we're copying the contents of S3 into S2, and that's going to be just doing what's called a, a byte-wise copy of the contents of the stack. And if you recall what the stack looked like, it had this pointer in it, and so we're just going to end up copying the pointer. So now we've got two pointers in two different stacks that point to the same memory, and that's what's called aliasing. And aliasing is a very, very nasty, nasty problem in, uh, in C and C++ code that's written in this type of a way. And uh, as you'll see, this, this kind of motivates C++'s assignment operator capabilities, which we'll talk about later. Then when we're all done, we go ahead and destroy these uninitialized stacks. So let's say, we, let's say for sake of argument that we actually did not create the stack. Well, down here, we're trying to destroy it. And as we'll see, that's going to cause chaos and insanity. Um, so we still have problems in this code, even though we made things a little bit better. So let's go take a look at the stack implementation. And you can see how it works under the hood. So here's the stack create method. It looks very, very similar to the stack create method we had for the information hiding and version of this, except now we refer to a specific stack passed as a pointer to the stack create method. So everywhere we're accessing the fields, we say s arrow top, s arrow size, s arrow stack, and so on. All the other code is identical. It's just that we're able to specifically designate the stack that we're trying to work with. Same thing's true for stack destroy. We pass in a pointer so we can delete the appropriate stack element. That's why if you have failed to initialize this, then you're going to get really weird results when you try to free up something that was never initialized in the first place. That's what's called deleting unallocated pointers, which is also going to cause you insanity and, and headaches. We also do a bunch of push operations. Stack push works the same way. We have to pass the address of the stack that we're pushing something on. Stack pop, same thing. Stack top, stack empty, stack full. So the actual implementation here is all the same, but we just have to pass the address of the stack as the first parameter. So let's go back over here, just for kicks. Let's, let's first demonstrate how to do this um, without having bugs. So let's go ahead and if zero this stuff out. So we're going to if zero. And um, let me go ahead and copy this guy up here or copy him out. And then we can say hash end if. This is one of the few kind of quasi-legitimate uses of the preprocessor to quickly get rid of code you don't want to be seen by your compiler. So hopefully this code will run and produce the results that we want. And in fact, it does. That's a good thing. Um, but if we go back and turn this to if1, which now lets it compile, let's see what happens. So you can see that it was interrupted by a signal, sig abort. That means we, we did something bad. And um, I'm not able to show you on this particular computer how to debug these particular things because I'm running on my Mac, which doesn't have Valgrind installed. But we'll come back at a later point when we talk about memory management, and I'll show you how to, how to use memory management capabilities if you're running on a, a Linux-based computer so it'll actually detect these kinds of problems. All right, so let's go ahead and restore this thing to its previous bad state. So next time I teach this course, we will remember that it was broken. All right. So there we go. So that's really the discussion of, that's actually the code that goes along with the data abstraction version of C. And let's just kind of compare and contrast this. So, so what's good about it? Well, one good thing is we can have more than one stack. Yay. We can also solve some of the problems with namespace pollution. In particular, we call it stack, pu <clears throat> stack push, stack pop, 
stack top, stack empty, and so on. So rather than calling it, you know, push pop and top, which are probably going to be other symbols in the global namespace, we've made it a little bit more likely to not have namespace collisions. It's not perfect by any means, but it's a little better. Um, but other than that, there's still all kinds of problems. We aren't guaranteeing initialization, destruction, or assignment. We saw that those things were all still very problematic. We still only have one type of stack. We've got all these method calls that we're having to make all over the place as opposed to the original code that was the original bare bones version that had no method call overhead whatsoever. The error handling is still very ad hoc. And another big problem here is that even though we, we try to be more abstract by having stack using the, uh, you know, using a struct, structs in both C and C++ by default don't have any access control protection. So people can reach underneath there and muck with top and change size and do all kinds of crazy stuff. And the compiler won't help you. It won't save you from your, your sloppiness, which is not a good thing, of course. Okay, so that's the data abstraction in C analysis. So at this point, we've kind of beaten up on C enough for the time being. And what we're going to do now is we're going to turn our attention to C++. So this is the end of the C style, how not to do it stack implementations.